Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. Forget about a taste of spring. Mother Nature may be canceling the rest of winter completely. All right, Ben, also a farewell to Mr. I. Visitation underway at the Fox Theater as the public pays their last respects to a Detroit icon. But first, a coordinated multi-city drug bust exposes an extremely dangerous situation inside a Detroit home and four young children were living inside. It wasn't crack or heroin being made inside that house. It was fentanyl, a drug more powerful than both of them. Let's break down the latest in this story. State police raided this home on Detroit's west side where a working fentanyl lab was found in the basement. Now, as that happened, another home was being raided in Livonia. And it's believed most of those dangerous opiates were sold in Livingston and Washtenaw counties. Sean Lay following the story for us, and he joins us now live. And Sean, we should also point out there were children living in that house. And now those children technically along with their mother are homeless. They cannot get back inside. Let me direct your attention to that orange sticker that state police plastered on the window. there, saying the home is contaminated along with everything else in there. It will likely be condemned. That's how dangerous this drug is. Four very small children removed from a potentially deadly situation. It's crazy involving little kids and stuff. A state police drug task force raiding this home on Beaverlin. Investigators finding what they're describing as a fentanyl lab in the basement, local four, obtaining this photo of some of what was found. Bunches of small bindles containing the incredibly dangerous drug. Another photo from inside shows that a large amount of the drug was left out in the open and nothing to prevent those kids living here from coming into contact with it. When police made the bus this morning, they brought the kids to Shavante Thomas's home next door. I think dad must have asked because he knows us. Can they come over because they didn't want to put them in the back of a police car? She says the kids are 10, 5, 2, and a newborn. Investigators say when their team went in, they saw powder in the basement and they backed out and hazmat was called in. Fentanyl is the deadly cousin of heroin, 100 times more potent than morphine. Touch it or breathe it in and it can kill you. Buckets were brought out containing what police believe is the drug. Neighbors here are absolutely stunned. That? No way, Jose. I'm totally shocked. I woke up at 8 o'clock and I seen all this commotion going on. And as far as, as, far as I know, he's a good family guy. Well, tonight that father is in custody. Everything here at the house, including the skateboard car seats left behind. The photos our sources are showing us uh, show what I'm being told is a lot of this drug being tested. I'm told the testing is showing that it is pure fentanyl, which is just so dangerous to be around. Coming up live at 6 o'clock, the DEA, Devin, recently put out a video featuring two police officers from a different jurisdiction who came in contact with fentanyl. They almost died. So out here today, they were armed with plenty of Narcan, the fentanyl antidote. Back to you. It's awfully dangerous stuff, Sean, but what we saw today isn't the end of this, though, correct? Yeah, this is a big investigation involving, uh, you know, Washtenaw County, as well as uh, Livingston County as well. Investigators say they're going to go house to house. Who was producing it, packaging it up, and then selling it on the street? They expect many more arrests. All right, Sean. A Dearborn Heights father is pleading guilty to the murders of his four children. 50-year-old Gregory Green pleaded guilty this morning to killing his four children last September. Green also pleaded guilty to torturing his wife. His two biological children were killed by carbon monoxide poisoning. His two ch stepchildren were shot execution style. As part of his guilty plea, Green will spend at least 47 years in prison. We've seen quite a stream of people all day in front of the Fox theaters. The community gets their chance to bid farewell to Mike Illich. Sky 4 is live over the Fox Theater right now where a public visitation is underway. It runs until 8 o'clock tonight. Steve Garagiola is there too. And Steve, you showed us the long line at 4 o'clock. It's just further proof of how many lives uh, Mr. I touched. Boy, isn't that the truth? A uh, steady flow of of fans and friends here this afternoon. Everybody who passed through the Fox got a little keepsake, a card to take home with them, just a, a memory of this day, because they want to hang on to the memories of what Mike Illich has done for this city. So many people here who never even met the man. And I asked them, why did you want to be here today? And the answers they gave say a lot about who Mike Illich was. The public viewing welcomed fans and friends who never met the man. 
Yet they lined up in bitter cold to pay their respects because in some way he had touched all of their lives. It's just something like to pay honor to somebody who really did a lot for me. You know, me growing up, I don't know him personally, but, it, but he did a lot. He made me really happy. Longtime Detroiters remember what this city was like 30 years ago, which is why Fernando Puente wanted to be here today. Because I personally think Mike Kelly saved the city of Detroit. If he hadn't invested his money in the 80s, I don't know where we'd be right now. Young Detroiters honor what Mike Illich did for today's Detroit. I hear it because Mr. Illich was just such a huge like, advocate for youth hockey in Michigan. And I was lucky enough to play for Little Caesars. And he just, that's what everyone dreamed of as a kid. And I did too to play for Little Caesars. And everyone thinks it's, it is the best organization in Michigan for sure. And I'm so honored to be a part of it. I could not be wearing this more proud, honestly. He represented a rare combination, a multi-billionaire who never forgot his roots in the city that he loved so much. I want to pay respects to Mr. Detroit, Mike Elish, resurrecting the two franchises the way he did and uh, the, um, you know, the, what he did for the city, the Fox Theater and everything, it's going to be missed. <laughs> Mr. Detroit, yeah, he definitely very quietly touched so many lives in this community. I also talked with some folks today that knew him very well. So who was Mike Illich? We'll hear from them coming up at six o'clock. Uh, again, uh, the service, the viewing is open until 8 p.m. tonight, so uh, if you're still watching right now, feel free to come on down. Reporting live at the Fox Theater, I'm Steve Garagiola, Local 4. All right, Steve, thank you. And take a look here at what the Wings are wearing on their jerseys to honor Mike Illich. The team posted this photo to Twitter today. They've decided to ditch the traditional initials and go with this patch that simply reads Mr. I. Nice touch. Oh, they all, all the yeah. players knew him. Yeah. Yep. Well, let's turn to the weather. We got a bit of snow moving through. Well, after all, it is February, and Ben, it's going to feel like it tonight for sure. Yeah, uh, you're not going to screw up and end up wearing the same thing twice this week. I can tell you that much. We have been all over the place, and after yesterday's sunshine and warm temperatures, the clouds and the snow are out here right now, and visibility have been close to 10 miles most of the day, but some of these snow showers have become just a little bit more intense, especially this one that's rolling across northern Oakland County. So if you're going to be commuting on 75 in the next couple hours or really just about the next hour, uh, keep that in mind. Temperatures continuing to fall tonight. They'll end up being about 10 degrees colder tonight than what we woke up to this morning. By far our coldest start of the forecast and wait till you see what we got for you for Saturday and Sunday. That's coming up in your seven day forecast in minutes. Devin? Well, about an hour ago, Andrew Puzder, uh, President Trump's pick for Labor Secretary, withdrew his nomination. That uh, comes amid reports Republican senators were at odds over the fast food CEO's fitness to run the Labor Department. All of that happening as the president met today with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and the fallout over new allegations of the Trump administration's ties to Russia is far from over. Tracy Potts following it all from the White House tonight. Tracy. Devin, good evening from the White House, where the big news tonight was supposed to be this meeting between President Trump and Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And while that happened, and we certainly heard from both of them, a lot of it's been overshadowed by questions here about Russia. I think it's very, very unfair what's happened to General Flynn. President Trump defending the national security advisor he asked to resign, but not addressing the New York Times report that the FBI tracked phone calls between Trump campaign aides and Russian intelligence while Russia was being investigated for trying to influence the election. Instead, the president today attacked the media and leaks from inside his administration. And the documents and papers that were illegally, I stress that, illegally leaked. It's criminal action, criminal act. Classified information, he calls it, being given out like candy. The, the question of leaks, uh, you know, is uh, certainly implicated here, but there are far bigger fish to fry. Like Russia's influence during the election, General Flynn's connections to Russia, and why the president waited weeks to act after being notified Flynn could be subject to blackmail, while Vice President Pence was left in the dark. Top Democrats are demanding a full timeline from the White House, and they want Attorney General Jeff Sessions off the case. If this trail leads to the Oval Office, the person investigating that trail should not be the same person who helped put President Trump there. Intelligence and other congressional panels are investigating, but Democrats worry the Republican-led committees won't dig deep enough. That's why they're pushing for an independent investigation. Plus, today, Senate Democrats made a big public point of telling the administration to hold on to documents and records that might help in that investigation. 
at the White House. Tracy Potts, Local 4. All right, Tracy, and the president seems to be hitting the campaign trail again, sort of. Uh, the president tweeted this afternoon he'll be holding a rally Saturday at 5 p.m. inside a hangar at the Orlando Melbourne Airport. A car slams into a building on Detroit's west side. Take a look here at the video of the scene at Joy Road and Broad Street Avenue. At this point, it's unclear if there are any injuries or why the car ended up in that building. We'll keep you updated on this story as any new developments come into our newsroom. Troy Police Chief James Craig released more details today about the officer involved shooting that killed a 19 year old man on Monday. Police say the man was fleeing from officers in a stolen car when he crashed into a building. The suspect then fled on foot and was chased down by a DPD officer. After a struggle, the officer shot and killed the man. Chief Craig said the officer shot the suspect because he thought he had a gun and feared for his life. Uh, there was what we believe to be a physical altercation uh, between the officer and the suspect resulting in a single shot being fired. The officer felt for his safety and that was why he made the decision uh, to fire his weapon. Chief Craig says both DPD and Michigan State Police are investigating and that investigation should be complete by Monday. Rod Maloney following some big business news tonight. Rod. You're looking at one of those modern workplaces with the foosball and the puppy dogs in the workplace. It is about fun and it's about taking, not taking yourself too seriously. But they have succeeded spectacularly here. And so we're going to show you how they're ready for liftoff. That story ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rod. And Dearborn police make a string of important arrests. We'll tell you who could be facing terrorism charges for something that sent shockwaves through the department. Detroit police call to a popular high rise here in downtown after residents find some disturbing words on the wall. What was stated ahead? Tonight on New at 6. Yes, our roads are bad, but this might be worse. New at 6, the infrastructure problem we can't see that poses a much bigger danger than potholes. Also, an internet sting, that's another alleged sexual predator at 6, who police say this man thought he was going to meet. For the second time in a week, racist graffiti has been found inside a Detroit building. This is what folks living inside the Cadillac Square apartments found spray painted on the walls, but that was just part of it. There were also flyers taped to apartment doors purportedly from the KKK. Let's get to Jermont Terry live in Jermont. Any clue on who may have done this? No idea at this particular juncture, Kimberly, but we do know that this graffiti talked about doing physical harm to African Americans, and this hate speech was found on more than just one floor. Here's what popped up on several floors at the Cadillac Square Apartments in downtown Detroit. It's racist and threatening to those who call this high-rise home. Kill blacks, go home in, or else. Wow. Wow. But before noticing the graffiti, Megan Kirk spotted these recruitment flyers for the Ku Klux Klan. They lined her neighbor's doors, but when she got to her front door... It's like halfway under, and when I was on my way to work this morning, I saw the graffiti sprayed near the elevators and like near some residents' doors. It's believed the graffiti and letters popped up at some time in the early morning hours, and it targeted many ethnic groups. N-word, lots of swastikas. Residents have to get buzzed into the building, and guests must sign in. That leaves many to wonder just how random this may be. I feel like it's a resident, someone who's already had access to the building who wouldn't have needed to be buzzed in. Maybe they were already at home. The management refused to answer any of my questions, but we do know police were called. They did a tour of the building this morning and they did come by with DPD. They took pictures, they took statements from people. The message is disturbing and it has many saying the person responsible must be a coward. Say it to my face, you know, I mean, you're not ashamed to write it. It looks like kids writing. Maybe that's the intelligence that they have. You know what I'm saying? The level of intelligence. Now, they do have cameras in the lobby, but not on each individual floor. Now, management and police are most definitely looking over the limited video that they have, and it is believed that this person started on the top floor and worked his or her way all the way down to the ninth floor before they ran out of spray paint. Of course, if you know anything, contact police. Reporting live in downtown, Jermont Terry, Local 4. And Jermont, you know, we reported a similar incident last week on Wayne State's campus. Are investigators thinking that right. these two incidents might be connected? 
Well, it's too early to say right now, Kimberly, but obviously if they find an image in this, um, in the in the video, that will likely be key to figure out if, he's, sure. if these people are connected or not, yeah. but they just want to find who's responsible and the people just want all of this to stop. I, I'm sure, yeah, we all do. Okay, we will uh, keep you covered. Thank you, Jamont. So my big repair efforts are underway now to restore a DTE plant that shut down after being heavily damaged by a fire. You may remember the story. A massive fire broke out back in August at the DTE plant in East China Township near the St. Clair River. Fire started in a generating unit fired by coal. That plant has been closed since. Uh, but we hear large scale repair efforts are underway and the plant is now expected to be fully restored by July. You know, July when there won't be snow falling. <laughs> Like there is now. We can't be upset about it no, though because it no, is no. February. We've it's and had we've a nice run. Off pretty easily we really have for the most part. Yeah, yeah. this is and this is really just a speed bump in what is going to be a fantastic finish yeah. to this yeah. week. I mean, we can't say that enough, and you'll see those numbers in a minute. But uh, what we've got out there right now is a whole lot different than what we saw yesterday. 20 degrees colder here in Detroit, and we're pretty much the center of the cool down. Uh, compared to what we had for Valentine's Day. So that cold air just sort of uh, holding itself here over the Great Lakes. And we've got one more chilly day before the warmer stuff will start whirling in. You can see already out in the Plain States, they've got warmer temperatures today than what they had yesterday. And we'll start getting some of that warm air in here by the end of the week. Kansas City's at 52. And uh, here's a spoiler alert. We'll probably see warmer numbers than that by the time we get towards the end of the forecast. But tonight it is snow that's out there. It's not going to be accumulating, maybe sitting on the grass in a couple spots, and that's going to be about it. But it's really not going to last much longer. Uh, these snow showers should be drying out as we get past sunset tonight. So 8, 9 o'clock, these should be gone, and we'll be left with mostly cloudy skies overnight. Beyond this, we don't have any precipitation to talk about until really the beginning of next week. So high pressure is going to be in control. We start moving up Friday, but it's really when this warm front passes through going into the weekend that we see the barn doors fly open. And here comes the warm air uh, that's going to settle in for more than just one day. And you'll get to see that here in just a second. Four zone forecast though deals with tonight's lows, which will be about 10 degrees colder than what we started out with this morning, right around 21 degrees in the city. Most low Locations are going to be down into the teens, including areas closer to 275. South zone 19 or 20 are your choices down here. Winds will be just a little bit lighter than what we woke up to this morning, so the wind chills will actually be very similar uh, to what we saw this morning. Air temperatures again 18, 19 here in our west zone, and our coldest will be up here in Santa Lake County, 16 up in Sandusky and Marlette, reaching almost 20 degrees. Uh, down towards M59. And then once we get into the afternoon, very similar to what we've got out there today, temperatures just peaking above freezing, but we'll get the sunshine back towards the tail end of the day, starting with clouds, finishing with sunshine. And man, you can't say enough good stuff about this. 57 degrees on Saturday, 54 on Sunday, and then make it a run at 60 on Monday. And it's coming with sunshine. We really don't have any problems to talk about. Uh, maybe some rain on Tuesday, but it's still going to be 53. I mean, what and do you Monday's say about that? Almost 60 degrees in February. Unbelievable. Yeah. Where is that groundhog again? Yeah, we need to have a little <laughs> protection program <laughs> down for an intervention. <laughs> uh, okay, Ben, here's Hank with a look at what he's working on. He's the young shooting victim who's inspired so many, including a local judge here in Wayne County. Why this judge wanted to meet this seven year old boy. My story is. All right, Hank, but first, a former Detroit and Westland police officer under arrest in Florida will tell you what he's accused of doing at a Tampa bar that could keep him behind bars for the rest of his life. Doc? Someone in the U.S. suffers a heart attack every 43 seconds. Would you know what to do if it was you? I'm Dr. Frank McGeorge. Tomorrow at 5, I'll show you the four steps that could help save your life. Welcome back. A uh, local twist to a Florida story. One person is dead and another is behind bars after a shooting near Tampa. Yeah, early this morning, deputies say Brian Midich walked into the bar and shot another man several times, killing him. Now, Midich was a Detroit police officer for five years, then went to Westland and worked as an officer there for 13 years. He left the Westland PD about two years ago because of an off-duty medical issue that kept him from being able to work. Midich has been living in East Lake, Florida.
In southwest Detroit, police are on the hunt for three men suspected of robbing a business, and it was all caught on tape. This is video from November 25th, taken on the 1400 block of Vermont near Rosa Parks and Bagley. You can see there three men in a white pickup truck drove up to the back of this business. When they left their car, they broke in, stole several things, and then took off. If you have any information, contact Detroit Police. A flight from North Carolina to Mississippi declares an emergency after it collides with a deer during takeoff. This is a new one. Uh, today at around 12.15, the flight attempted to take off from Charlotte Douglas International Airport. And right about that time, the collision occurred as a result of the deer strike. The plane began leaking fuel. American Airlines officials say none of the 44 passengers uh, or the four crew members was hurt. New at 5.30. It's one of those feel-good, local, American dream success stories. Our goal is to sell the very best outdoor stuff and have the most fun while doing it. How one local store turned into a $50 million sale. That story ahead. Is it just a stuffy nose or a sign of something worse? The cold hard facts about spotting a sinus infection, it's probably not what you think. And I'm Nick Monticelli in Dearborn, where the police chief laid out some updates on major cases involving one, a terrorist threat involving a car that would plow through the front door with explosives. It's dinner time. Live from downtown Detroit, local 4 news at 530 starts now. A bizarre threat of terrorism aimed at a local police department and nobody knew about it until there was an arrest in the case. It tops our news at 530. In Dearborn, crime dropped 3% last year. It's just one of the things the police chief discussed while updating major cases. As Nick Monticelli reports, one of their big cases, though, is something none of us knew about. And that case involves a threat of terror with demands that if aren't met, a car would plow through this front door with explosives. Good morning, I'm uh, Ronald Haddad, the chief of the city of Dearborn. Dearborn Police Chief Ron Haddad is making press conferences like this kind of a habit, discussing major cases tied to murders, larceny, ethnic intimidation, and more, including a threat of terrorism involving this man, Brian Short. On New Year's Day, Short allegedly sent an email to Haddad demanding a large amount of money. If he did not get it, a terrorist would drive a car into the police station and the district court and it would explode. The guy was trying to uh, extort money with more zeros and more commas than I can afford, and uh, it was an act of terror. As you can imagine, both buildings had to be searched. Nothing ever happened, but detectives were able to track down the sender. Now, Short faces up to 20 years in prison. The uh, cost to our resources and the attempt to terrorize the police, of all things, will not be accepted here. We figure we better protect ourselves. Haddad also talked about that much publicized case when men walked into their lobby wearing tactical gear and were heavily armed. Both men were eventually arrested and no shots were fired. One of the main points, though, is how many of their cases are solved thanks to tips. A commander here says many times people simply don't know what they know. A lot of times those phone calls go like, well, I don't know if this is really anything and you know, I kind of feel stupid calling and then they give us information. I'll tell you what, don't ever feel stupid calling. In Dearborn, Nick Monticelli, Local 4. Right, Nick, in fact, Dearborn police say about 50 times a year a tip helps solve a case. Breaking news right now, Sky 4 is over the scene of a crash in Bruce Township. This is on Van Dyke near 34 Mile Road. At least one person, we're told, in critical condition, though we do not yet know what caused the crash. You see, though, both cars right now with pretty bad damage. Uh, we'll keep an eye from the sky there as well as uh, finding out what's happening on the ground. We'll update it here on the broadcast side and on clickondetroit.com. In Ecorse, a man police thought was barricaded inside a home has turned himself in. The situation started about midnight when a man fired a shot at his girlfriend. The woman fled the home but left a four-year-old little girl inside. So police surrounded the home believing that the man was barricaded inside as well, but it turns out he was not there. He turned himself in about six this morning and the little girl is okay. Two rather strange bedfellows. Today, Walmart announced they're buying Michigan-based outdoor gear retailer Moose Jaw. On the surface, it might not seem that Walmart would have any interest in selling what Moose Jaw sells, but there's one thing they do very well that makes them so appealing. For the answer on that, let's bring in our business editor, Rod Maloney, who's got more. Rod? 
e-commerce is what Moose Jaw does best. Now, it started out as a single store in Kego Harbor over 20 years ago, but they immediately went online before anybody even knew what it was. They were pioneers, and they got so good at it, so popular, that Walmart decided they had to buy them. Moose Jaw. He is as quirky as its name. The catalog's daring, stickers catchy. It's Madison Heights Call Center at its corporate headquarters. Neither looks nor acts conventional. <laughs> Ping pong and foosball tables. <laughs> Nerf rocket fights breaking out on a moment's notice. Oh, puppy has a dart. Little black dogs welcome to sit in on the headset banter. <laughs> CEO Owen Comerford says, believe it or not, it's something Walmart greatly appreciates. I mean, as they've said to me, hey, listen, one of the reasons that we're buying you is because of that brand, because of that zany culture. We would be fools to come in and then mess that up. This got started when the founder, Robert Wolf, who's camera shy, so there aren't any pictures, saw the gold in them there, Hills, unexpectedly. He was leading backpacking trips and he realized that uh, as a guide for these trips, people were spending more on the, the gear list than they were on the trip. So he said, hmm, I'm on the wrong side of this business. So he started another store with a friend of his. 25 years later, it's an overnight success and staying right here. We're a Michigan company. We're very proud of our Michigan heritage. Um, so it's going to mean more opportunities for people that want to get into e-commerce and the, and the outdoor industry because, you know, we're going to have to grow. Price on the sale, $51 million in cash. Now, they're buying it from a private equity company that bought Moose Jaw about 10 years ago. And the next step for them is to replace that warehouse. You saw 100,000 square feet of warehouse. They're bursting at the seams already. They figure in the next year or so, they're going to have to find another one. But they say it's likely to be in Madison Heights. Back to you. Well, uh, those of us who are fans of Moose Jaw certainly won't want to see it change too much. I'm curious, though, Rod, how, how did Moose Jaw get on Walmart's large radar? Well, let's remember that Walmart is the biggest retailer anywhere, yeah. right? But guess who's nipping at their heels? Amazon. So they're saying, well, there's a lot of money to be made in outdoor gear, and it's highly profitable. Well, who does it the best in that space yeah. that is online? Well, they saw Moose Jaw. Walmart called them and said, hey, we want to buy you, and that's the price they came up with. Quite a compliment to them. All right, Rod. Okay, over here in the Weather Center right now with Ben, pretty chilly today, but uh, we're really in for a treat later this weekend if you like warmer weather. We are assuming that people like it, but there aren't a lot of people who maybe want it to be cold. That's true. Uh, a lot of folks who enjoy skiing, but yeah. um, you'll Not get your weekend. shot. Not this week. <laughs> um, these next two days are going to be the closest thing you'll see to winter uh, in this forecast. The snow is out there. It's starting to lighten up. The only spots that we still have some issues with are going to be right here in Oakland County. So if you're going to be on 696 Woodward Telegraph, you're going to be running into those snow showers here within uh, probably in the next 30 to 45 minutes or so. This is the back edge, at least of the organized snow showers as that continues to move south. Uh, we should be drying up pretty quickly. There's another smaller batch, but again, this stuff is inconsequential. It's not going to lead any accumulation, but you're probably going to see some flakes, especially on 94 and Gratia here on the east side. Otherwise, we got drier conditions to get through the night tonight. And once we hit our lows overnight, temperatures only going up from there. We'll show you all the numbers in the seven day forecast coming up, guys. All right, Ben. Malaysian police have arrested a woman now in connection with the death of Kim Jong un's half. Brother. The leader of North Korea's half brother died yesterday after becoming suddenly ill at a Malaysian airport. Today, police arrested a woman who they believe may have attacked the brother with a chemical spray. An exact cause of death has yet to be determined. Pharmaceutical company Merck says it's halting trial testing of its Alzheimer's drug after disappointing results. An independent study found its Alzheimer's drug has virtually no chance of working. It calls the drug's failure, quote, disappointing. Experts call it a substantial setback. About 47 million people worldwide are living with Alzheimer's disease turned dementia. The number is expected to double. That's why experts remind us that staying physically active and eating a low-fat diet are all ways to prevent Alzheimer's. In good health, suffering from a cold, or is it a sinus infection? Uh, when you and everyone around you seems to have a runny or stuffy nose, it can be difficult to tell. Experts say one of the biggest clues, though, is probably not what most of us think. Classically, people say, well, I've got this yellowish green mucus. I've got a sinus infection. Well, not necessarily. 
Going by the color of your mucus is the most common sinus infection misconception, so says Dr. Michael Benninger, an ear, nose, and throat doctor at the Cleveland Clinic. He cautions a common cold can also produce discolored mucus. The color of the mucus doesn't have anything to do with whether that's a virus or a bacteria. It has to do with your own white blood cell response to the organism, to the pathogen. Instead, the best indicator of whether you have a sinus infection is often the length of time you've been suffering. A viral cold will usually get better within seven to 10 days. After that, if symptoms are worse, it's more likely that you're developing a bacterial infection. Pain placement is another clue. Some facial pain and discomfort are common. Headaches are usually not related to sinus infections. If you have classic headaches, it probably isn't sinus. Um, sinuses rarely cause headaches. They kind of cause this mid-facial pressure and fullness and you, you just feel poorly. To ease the symptoms of both colds and sinus infections, Dr. Benninger recommends using steroid nasal sprays, zinc lozenges, and a neti pot. One other interesting note here, sinus infections are typically treated with antibiotics. Dr. Benninger advises against taking antihistamines because those thicken mucus and they can actually make a sinus infection feel even worse. Never knew I needed to no. pay more attention to my mucus and <laughs> exactly. the color of it to know what, what to color do. color chart, exactly. <laughs> uh, one of the most stunning images, and it's hard to believe it's even real, but it is. New tonight, what's happening in this photo that makes a waterfall look like it's on fire. Also, Facebook wants to play an even bigger role in your life because it's not big enough. The new tool they're set to roll out that'll make it easier than ever to follow your friends every move. Hey there, Hank. Hey, Devin, tonight, Donovan's story. The young boy who was the victim of a drive-by getting a big honor from a local judge. We'll see. New at 6. New at 6 o'clock, a fentanyl lab busted in Detroit. We'll hear police in their own words describe just how dangerous this drug is when they came in contact with it. I thought I was, I thought I was dying. I was, that's, that's what my body felt like. Also new at 6, I'll give you an exclusive inside look at what was found in this lab. It's a problem that affects millions of men, but one they're reluctant to discuss. I'm Dr. Frank McGeorge. Tonight in Good Health, men, depression, and the challenges of getting help. Now the little boy who has so captured our hearts. Uh, last night we introduced you to Donovan Lyles. He may have lost his eye in a drive-by shooting, but he certainly never lost his spirit. Our Hank Winchester helped Donovan get a prosthetic eye, but as Hank told us last night, what he got in return was <laughs> much more. Yeah, nearly brought tears to both of our eyes. How Hank is here now. Hank, this little boy is just so special. Yeah, he is, right? I mean, just you saw him in the story last night, and you were talking about what a great kid he is, yeah. and, and we've had the opportunity to get to know Donovan, and he truly is an inspiration. In fact, we did a story with Donovan several months ago. A local judge saw just a few seconds of Donovan within that story, and she said she just had to meet him. Oh, Donovan Lyles, a seven-year-old boy full of energy. Oh. He excels in school and savors every second of life. How old do you think I am? 20-something. Thank you. You're my best friend. <laughs> Even when life wasn't fair, he chose to focus on the positive. Donovan was shot when he was five, the victim of a drive-by. Donovan is alert at the hospital. However, he lost an eye. For the last two years, he's lived his life wearing an eye patch. Honestly, it's almost like it was harder on me than him. Like he, the next day, he was down at the children's hospital in the gym playing while I'm like laying there just looking at him. We knew we could help. So together with Sparky Anderson's foundation, Catch and Henry Ford Hospital, Donovan finally got a prosthetic eye at no cost to his family. Morning. What's up, man? How are you? His story, his strength, and his courage inspired many, including Wayne County Judge Cynthia Hathaway. My husband and I met Donovan at Thurgood Marshall Elementary School uh, because of the uh, coverage that Mr. Winchester gave uh, to uh, Donovan's story. Judge Hathaway went to our adopted school, Thurgood Marshall, to meet Donovan, and then... Donovan, Emery, and Eternity, please come up. Asked Donovan and his sisters to hold the Bible as she was sworn in one last time. 
of Judge of the Third Circuit Court of Michigan. It's my honor and my privilege to say, let's welcome back Judge Cynthia Gray. <laughs> Donovan's strength and his courage moving a judge who has seen a lot in her courtroom over the years. But it was a seven-year-old boy who reminded her and who reminded me and so many others that life is what you make of it, that attitude is everything. So a little of the backstory, after we aired that first story about the school and included a little bit of Donovan, I saw Judge Hathaway at a Detroit Lions game. She happened to be sitting right in front of me and she turned around and she said, who's that kid? I need to meet him. And within two days, she was started. at the school and meeting Donovan. It's all by fate. I yeah. met Donovan just because he ran past me in the hall. I see Judge Hathaway at a Lions game. He and makes an impression. Everything yeah. happened. Well, in fact, I noticed there's no video of Donovan just sitting down. Talk, you know, <laughs> it's <quietly>. impossible. <laughs> he just is full of energy. Yeah, he is always on the move. In fact, when he first uh, had the testing equipment in for the prosthetic eye, he had a few issues where he's so active that it would be moving around quite a bit. Yeah. So they couldn't get a yeah. good, yeah. Uh, you know, a summary on it. Eventually they told him, slow it down for slow about 48 down. hours. Well, you mentioned he's also gonna have to have some work on his Still eyelid. And yeah. so, so, I mean, that to, to get to that point was about 15 different appointments. So he's gonna Jeez. have two yeah. or three more. Right. Not intimidated by any of it, yeah. loves it. Doesn't appear to be, time. no, I no. Know. And I loved it that he said that you're about 20 years old when you yeah. asked, how old do you think I am? Hey, the kid <laughs> speaks the truth. The kid <laughs> speaks yeah, the truth. Love it. We're going with 20, it. right? We're going with 20, let's just keep it there. All right, Hank, thank you. Well, how about this next story? P.J. Fleck left Western Michigan for the University of Minnesota, and now his rallying cry, Roll the Boat, is leaving too. This morning, Western Michigan agreed to transfer the rights to the phrase, Row the Boat, to Fleck at the University <laughs> of Minnesota. In return, Fleck is going to give Western at least $50,000 that will go toward scholarships for uh, a, a football player, at least one. 